has been slashing our armed forces and will not commit to two percent and is happy for us not to be able to defend our islands. i think mr juncker has given us the answer we are going to do it at an eu level and we are going to have a european army. when i raised this last year with the deputy prime minister liberal democrat nick clegg he said it was a dangerous fantasy to even talk about an eu army. i hope every liberal democrat voter has heard mr verhofstadt today the leader of the european liberals crying out for militarisation at an eu level. mr verhofstadt i know that by heckling you increase your hits on youtube because otherwise <laughs> nobody in europe wants to listen to you. the point i was making is this the opportunity is being seized and mr juncker said we must convey to russia that we are serious. Who do you think you are kidding, Mr Juncker? <laughs> we do not want any part of an EU army and I doubt the rest of the peoples of Europe do either. Thank you. you. Really like really good, <laughs> I was in this chamber at the time when Libya was attacked. I heard the Liberals and the Greens screaming, frothing at the mouth for us to bomb Libya for us to become militarily involved because we believed that would make things better. My view, sir, is if you look at Afghanistan, if you look at Iraq, if you look at Libya, and you look at the attempt to back the rebels in Syria, many of whom have now morphed into ISIS, we see that our recent foreign military interventions have made things worse, not better. The good guys, bad guys story, uh, really I take from your own Foreign Secretary and Party Member William Hague, who of course was urging the international community to arm the rebels, something that struck me, given we know Al Qaeda's in, in, in involvement, as being total and utter madness. I am cynical and sceptical, as are much of the European public, about who has used those weapons until we get the full report and we get the intelligence right. We went to war in Iraq, we went to war in Iraq being told that Saddam had weapons of... Why don't you shut up and listen for a change? You must be, you really must be the vilest, rudest man in European politics. And you rant on and the chair lets you get away with it because you're the former Prime Minister of Belgium. Well, there we are. Um, so, Mr Tannock, I understand what you're saying. I understand something ghastly has happened here, but before you take military action, you need to be certain you're going to make things better and not worse. Well, I'm afraid what we got was you. And I'm sorry, but after that performance earlier that you gave, and I don't want to be rude, but, but you know, really, you have the charisma of a damp rag and the appearance of a low-grade bank clerk. You appear to have a loathing for the very concept of the existence of nation states. Perhaps that's because you come from Belgium, which of course is pretty much a non-country. I have to ask you, having listened to your words this morning, just what planet are you on? This pretense that everything's going incredibly well. The EU is mired in deep structural crisis. You say the EU is fantastic in a recent comment. You're supporting the destruction of national democracy. But it's with reference to Greece that I'm most concerned about you because uh, when faced with their recent enslavement, you said, we lived for many years as a non-sovereign non country under Soviet occupation. For us, European integration is not a threat to sovereignty because we experienced not long ago a serious threat to our sovereignty. So what are you saying? That this isn't quite as bad as the USSR? Is that really good enough for your people? Post-1945, there were some very sensible ideas put together, namely the Council of Europe. Let's have a Europe where we sit down together, where we have a free trade agreement, where we agree minimum standards on work, on the environment. We can do all of these things without a European Commission, without a European Parliament and without a European Court of Justice. We've done it in security terms with NATO. Yes, it'll mean you'll lose your job, Mr. Broso, but apart from that, apart from that, why can't we do things as mature democracies? Yes, I want you sacked, Mr. Schultz, as well. I want you all fired. We can do those things, and that is a positive way forward. By taking away from people their ability to govern themselves and transferring that power to the European Commission, we're headed for a Europe of rebellion and violence. Let's take the democratic route. Minister, you received some criticism this afternoon for your comment, British jobs for British workers, but you can brush that aside. 
because from the moment you said it i do not think anybody seriously thought that you would ever as a british prime minister put the interests of british workers above that of your european dream and my goodness me you showed that this afternoon. it is just a pity that apart from ukip virtually nobody seems to have bothered to turn up to listen to you. and as far as the economy is concerned you have told us that somehow you are the economic guru you are the man that can save the world. well i remember very well your first big act as chancellor when you sold 400 metric tonnes of gold on the world's exchanges at $275 an ounce. At today's valuation, that would be $10 billion higher. But it is not just the fact you got it wrong, because we can all get it wrong. It was the fact that you announced in advance how much you were going to sell and on what day you were going to sell it. It was a, an error so basic that the average A-level economic student, even in these educationally devalued times, would not have done. To add to that, you have destroyed our private pension system. You took away from the Bank of England its ability to regulate the banks and gave it to the tick box bureaucrats at the FSA in Canary Wharf. And we have not heard an apology. Your government has apologised for the Amritsar massacre. You have apologised for slavery. You have apologised for virtually everything. Will you please apologise for what you did as British Chancellor and then perhaps we might just listen to you. Thank you. At that time, the whole edifice is beginning to crumble. Uh, there's chaos. Uh, the money's running out. I should thank you. You should perhaps be the pin up boy of the Eurosceptic movement. But just look around this chamber this morning. Just look at these faces. Look at the fear. Look at the anger. Poor old Barroso here looks like he's seen a ghost. You know, they're beginning to understand that the game is up. And yet, in their desperation, to preserve their dream, they want to remove any remaining traces of democracy from the system. And it's pretty clear that none of you have learned anything. You know, when you yourself, Mr. Van Rompuy, say that the euro has brought us stability, I suppose I could applaud you for having a sense of humour, but isn't this really just the bunker mentality? You know, your fanaticism is out in the open. You talked about the fact that it was a lie to believe that the nation state could exist in a 21st century globalised world. Well, that may be true in the case of Belgium, who have not had a government for six months, but for the rest of us, right across every member state in this union, and perhaps this is why we see the fear in the faces, increasingly people are saying, we don't want that flag, we don't want the anthem, we don't want this political class, we want the whole thing consigned to the dustbin of history. What they're being told as their government's collapsing, is that it would be inappropriate for them to have a general election. In fact, Commissioner Wren here said they had to agree their budget first before they'd be allowed to have a general election. Just who the hell do you think you people are? You are very, very dangerous people indeed. Your obsession with creating this Euro state means that you're happy to destroy democracy. You appear to be happy for millions and millions of people to be unemployed and to be poor. Untold millions must suffer so that your Euro dream can continue. What well, it won't work. Under your presidency, there have been 3,350 new legislative acts. Total failure on economic reform. On the CAP, you said you'd work to achieve a consensus for reform. Well, in a way, you have, I suppose, because you've got 24 countries against you. This budget deal is game, set and match to President Chirac. No cheese-eating surrender monkey. He, unlike you, he stands up for the French national interest, not some bizarre notion of Europe, and he has outclassed and outplayed you at every turn. Good morning, everybody. You're all very downbeat this morning. I thought this was going to be a big, proud moment. I mean, it's taken you eight and a half years of bullying, of lying, of ignoring democratic referendums. Eight and a half years it's taken you to get this treaty through, and on the 1st of December you will have it. And of course, the architect of all of this, Giscard, wanted from this constitutional treaty for the European Union to have a big global voice. But I'm afraid the leaders have suffered from a collective loss of nerve. They've decided that they want their faces to be up on the global stage, not somebody from the European Union, and so we've got appointed a couple of political pygmies. The Kissinger question 
of who to call in europe has not really been answered has it? i guess the answer can only be mr barroso because he is the only one that anybody in the world has ever heard of and is probably the big winner out of these posts. no wonder sir you look so happy this morning. and we have a new president of europe herman van rompuy. does not exactly trip off the tongue does it? Um, I can't see him stopping the traffic in Beijing or Washington. I doubt anybody in Brussels would even recognise who he is. And yet, he's going to be paid a salary that is bigger than Obama's, which tells you all you need to know about this European political class and how they look after themselves. Well, we have our two pygmies. We'll have the bland leading the bland. But I'm not celebrating because they'll press on with political union and whilst our leaders may have saved face for the moment for themselves on the international stage, they have all betrayed their national democracies. The European state is here. We're about to get an avalanche of new laws because of this Lisbon Treaty and there's no question in my mind that there has to be a full, free, fair referendum in the United Kingdom to decide whether we stay part of this union or not. I hope and pray that we vote to leave, but either way, the people simply must be asked. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Funny, isn't it? Funny, isn't it? Thank you very much for that. Afarad. Very warm welcome. Um, how things have Afarad. changed. Just a second, Mr. Farage. Ladies and gentlemen, one major quality of democracy is that you listen to those even if you don't share their opinion. Well, thank you, Mr. Schultz. Isn't it funny? You know, when I came here 17 years ago, and I said that I wanted to lead a campaign to get Britain to leave the European Union, you all laughed at me. Well, I have to say, you're not laughing now, are you? And the reason you're so upset, the reason you're so angry, has been perfectly clear from all the angry exchanges this morning. You, as a political project, are in denial. You're in denial that your currency is failing. You're in denial. Well, just well, just look at the Mediterranean. No, no, no. As a as a policy to impose poverty on Greece and the rest of the Mediterranean, you've done very well. And you're in denial over Mrs. Merkel, Mrs. Merkel's call last year for as many any people as possible to cross the Mediterranean into the European Union has led to massive divisions between countries and within countries. But the biggest problem you've got and the reason, the main reason the United Kingdom voted the way that it did is you have, by stealth, by deception, without ever telling the truth to the British or the rest of the peoples of Europe, you have imposed upon them a political union. You've imposed upon them a political union. And when the people in 2005 in the Netherlands and France voted against that political union, when they rejected the Constitution, you simply ignored them and brought the Lisbon Treaty in through the back door. What happened? What happened last Thursday was a remarkable result. It was indeed a seismic result, not just for British politics, for European politics, but perhaps even for global politics too, because what the little people did, what the ordinary people did, what the people who, who have been oppressed over the last few years and seen their living standards go down, they rejected the multinationals, they rejected the merchant banks, they rejected big politics, and they said, actually, we want our country back, we want our fishing waters back, we want our borders back. We want to be an independent, self-governing, normal nation. And that is what we have done. And that is what must happen. And in doing so, and in doing so we now offer a beacon of hope to Democrats across the rest of the European continent. I'll make one prediction this morning. 
the United Kingdom will not be the last member state to leave the European Union. So the question, the question is, what do we do next? Now, it is up to the British government to invoke Article 50. And I have to say that I don't think we should spend too long in doing it. I totally agree, uh, Mr Juncker, that the British, British people have voted. We need to make sure that it happens. But what I would like to see is a grown-up and sensible attitude to how we negotiate a different relationship. Now, now I, know, I know that virtually none of you have ever done a proper job in your lives <laughs> or worked or worked in business or worked in trade or indeed ever created a job but listen just listen Herr Farage Augenblick Mr Farage just a second Ladies and gentlemen, I do understand that you're getting emotional, but you're acting like UKIP normally acts in this chamber, so please, don't, don't imitate them. Mr Farage, however, I would say one thing to you. The fact that you're claiming nobody has done uh, a decent job in their life. You can't really say that. I'm sorry. No, you're quite, uh, you're quite right, Mr Schultz. UKIP used to protest against the establishment, and now the establishment protests against UKIP. So something has happened here. Let us listen to some simple, pragmatic economics. We, between us, between your countries and my country, we do an enormous amount of business in goods and services. That trade is mutually beneficial to both of us. That trade matters. If you were to decide to cut off your noses, to spite your faces, and to reject any idea of a sensible trade deal, the consequences would be far worse for you than it would be for us. And I, even, even no deal is better for the United Kingdom than the current rotten deal that we've got. But if we were to move to a position where tariffs were reintroduced on products like motor cars, then hundreds of thousands of German workers would risk losing their jobs. So why don't we just be pragmatic, sensible, grown up, realistic, and let's cut between us, let's cut between us a sensible tariff free deal and thereafter, and thereafter, recognize that the United Kingdom will be your friend, that we will trade with you, we will cooperate with you, we will be your best friends in the world. But do that, do it sensibly, and allow us to go off and pursue our global ambitions and future. Thank you. And now on the EFDD, Mr Farage. The London stock market's rallying strongly this morning. It is now 12% up since its February lows. Sterling is weak, but then it started declining from July 2014. And the Prime Ministers of Australia and New Zealand are now vying for who can be the first country from outside the EU to do a trade deal with the United Kingdom. Things are looking pretty good. The only upheaval is political upheaval, where we've seen a Prime Minister resign and indeed the British Commissioner Lord Hill resign. They've both done so, I think, for the right reasons. You never know, we may be getting rid of a Labour Party leader as well. But upheavals in politics can actually be a very healthy and a very good thing. Uh, and I got into politics because our political class in Britain led us towards a European political project. So if that result last week sweeps a few of them away, so be it, but I am looking forward next year to celebrating our Independence Day on June the 23rd. <laughs>